Good morning. Welcome to church this morning and happy new year to all of you. This is our Epiphany Sunday. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. I got to spend mine in Florida with some family and now I'm back in sunny New Jersey. So <laughs> a couple announcements this morning for you guys. Tonight at 7.30 in the sanctuary is our Epiphany concert. Adult and chapel choirs, as well as the choristers, will sing carols, songs, and anthems of the season to celebrate Epiphany, which is the commemoration of the coming of the Magi as the first expression of Christ to the Gentiles. A free will offering will be received, and please let the church know if you need child care because it will be provided this evening. Come and enjoy the sounds of our amazing choirs and the end of the season, just celebrate with joy and triumph. Second announcement this morning, on behalf of our pastors, church staff, and all lay leaders, we ask that you plan to be in worship next Sunday, January 13th, because on that morning, we will be sharing with you the 25 culture statements or ways that God is calling us to be the church together. These statements are the result of the work done by our session, our staff, with input from our deacons and trustees. So next Sunday, January 13th, Stuart will preach on the biblical and theological basis for this exciting work. And you'll receive a copy of our ways statements as well. For more, infor for more information, please see Stuart's Grace Note article on the front of our connections today. Also next Sunday, we are hosting a sit-down with session from 9.45 to 10.45 during the education hour to learn more about the 25 ways God is calling us to be the church together. So we encourage you to prioritize this meeting and join us for an exciting conversation about what it means to be FPC, and more importantly, the role that you play in this as well. So join us next Sunday, 9.45 in the Fellowship Hall, there's going to be no adult education courses to make room for this meeting. On that note, adult education will begin two weeks from today, January 20th. Chris and I, the other intern, will be exploring the book of Acts when the early church was formed. And so it'll be an informative conversation for us as we talk about church and culture, what it means to be first president of this town, what it meant for the Acts church back in that time, and how that informs us today. Um, so consider joining us if you would. That'll start January 20th during the education hour. And now I'd like to invite Joyce Peacock for a moment about the Ken Peacock Memorial Lecture Series. Thank you. Um, there seems to be an excitement in the air, kind of an, a new energy, a, a moving of the spirit, you might say. And what I would say is, um, have you considered, as you look forward to 2019 and the changes that you're considering, have you thought about your spiritual life? I have to think about myself as I'm you know, what ways might I want to have more of a Christian growth? When I think about it, how much is my Christian growth actually linked to my prayer life? In other words, I have to ask myself, how would I describe my prayer life? Irregularity? Is it kind of hard sometimes staying focused when my to-do list looms so large? What about the discomfort of when I want to talk to God, but I'm not quite sure how to go about it, what it is I'm supposed to say? Is there, is there some way of doing this better? And what about longer than five minutes? And then there's those times that didn't seem to work or struggles like, it's just so hard to be still. Or, how do I connect with the Spirit? Can I pray for what I want? 
How do I know that I'm praying in God's will? And then, well, he knows what I need. Do I bother him about it? Well, I have really good news for you. These, this past um, summer, fall, there have been two groups that have read a book called A Praying Life. Now, you might have this on your shelf. You may have already read it. But the author, Paul Miller, has been through so much of what we've experienced in prayer. And he's so honest and down to earth and encouraging about how to break through to understanding and feeling comfortable in prayer. So he's really trying to teach us that as we approach God, we're simply his children to talk to him like we're his child, to talk with him, because it's a conversation in a relationship. The last week of this month, I mean the last weekend of this month, January 25th and 26th, a praying life is coming in seminar form to our church. Now, we're talking interactive, getting some instruction, asking a lot of questions, getting a chance to try it, so that by the end of it, you're going to come away with a whole new perception you're going to discover the freedom to be yourself in prayer, to be consistent in your prayer life. You're going to learn how to pray for those impossible things, and in so doing, get a new energy, a new feeling of love for others, because you'll be overwhelmed with the love that you are receiving from your Father. So come, learn to relax in prayer, and experience its power. Now, the cost is free. We do gratefully accept any contributions. But your children also, there is child care going to be provided. So if you would just register their ages, their names, if there's any special needs, so we're sure to have the proper coverage if you have children that need to be taken care of. It begins Friday night. Doors open at 6. Um, 6.30 it starts. There'll be a few light refreshments. Ends by 9.15. The next morning, uh, Continental Breakfast is at 8.30 in the morning. Finishes by 12.30. So that you have the rest of the weekend to be with your family with your normal types of things that you do. But we ask that you please register. You'll see that there's a bulletin insert. I think the, some people that came through this door, they're sitting out there if you didn't get one in your bulletin. Register, there is a link, or a website that, that is a registration, but there's also a link on our website. And we just ask, we want to know somewhat the numbers by the 14th, because there are materials involved, and we want to be sure to have plenty for everyone. There will be some extras, so, you know, still come, but please, please, consider coming. You are going to walk away feeling absolutely revolutionized. I hope to see you there. Thank you, Joyce. Friends, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord this morning.
Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. Arise and shine, for your light has come. God has risen upon us and all the world. The mystery of God's grace has been revealed to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Celebrate and sing for joy. Through faith in Christ, we can boldly approach God and, and embrace his promises for our lives. God's love is for all people everywhere. Thanks be to God. Let us worship the one who brings us love and hope. Please remain standing for the prayer of adoration. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you that you made all things new. Thank you for all that you've allowed us, allowed into our lives this past year, the good along with the hard things, which have reminded us how much we need and rely on your presence, filling us every, every single day. We pray for your spirit to lead us each step of this new year. We ask that you will guide our decisions and turn our hearts to deeply desire you above all else. We ask that you will open doors needing to be opened and close the ones needing to be shut tight. We ask that you would help us release our grip on the things to which, you have, to which you've said no, not yet, or wait. We ask for your help to pursue you first above every dream and desire you've put within our hearts. We ask for your wisdom, for your strength and power to be constantly present within us. We pray that you would name us, make us strong, courageous for the new, new year and ahead. Give us ability beyond what we feel able. Let your gifts flow freely through us so that you would be honored by our lives and others would be drawn to you. To you be the glory and honor in this new year and forever. 
In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us affirm our faith in the new year as people around the world have been doing through the centuries. We say the Apostles' Creed to remember and confess who we are, that we are one people united in God's love and grace through Jesus Christ, <clears throat> no matter our circumstances. You can find the Apostles' Creed printed on the inside cover of your hymnal. People of faith, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time of confession and on the first Sunday of the new year, it's so meaningful as individuals and as a community to reflect. We reflect to consider who we're becoming, to ask whether our words and thoughts, our actions and attitudes honor Jesus. How would your neighbor describe you? Does your life witness to Christ's love, joy, hope and peace? or are you tangled up in other pursuits? Before we say the prayer of confession, let's take a few moments to reflect on, those, on these questions and silently confess our answers to God. And now together we say the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. God of glory, you sent Jesus among us, the light of the world, to reveal your love for all people. We confess that our sin and pride hide the brightness of your right. We turn away from the poor. We ignore the cries for justice. We do not strive for peace in your mercy Free us from our destruction and darkness. Baptize us once again in your spirit so we may be forgiven and renewed. Help us to radiate Christ's hope and light and love in our hurting world. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, when we bring our whole selves to God, we are never rejected. In fact, we are graciously forgiven loved and celebrated by the maker of heaven and earth. Friends, have no fear, you are forgiven. It's time to let go and be blessed by Christ's love and freedom in the new year. Thanks be to God. Let us embrace Christ's love and forgiveness. Live as new creations. Please remain standing for him number 710.
may be seated. Can I have all the children join me up front, please, for a children's sermon? Any children want to come forward? I know you. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, everyone. You can come over here. You want to come sit here? Right over here. You want to come up? No? Okay. You can stay there. That's fine. Hi, Sophia. You want to take a seat? Good morning. Come on, guys. Come take a seat. Okay. We have everyone here. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. How was everyone's Christmas? Good. Was it cold outside? Here? I wasn't here. I was in Florida, so I'm not sure how it was here. It's pretty sunny in Florida. It wasn't snowing. Oh. Well, this morning I would love to share with you all a story. It's actually a Jewish parable. It's called The King's Diamond. So listen closely. Long ago lived a wealthy king whose fortune was unrivaled. He possessed valuable treasures from all known lands, including paintings and sculptures from the world's greatest artists. The legend of his riches was punctuated by his most prized possession, a precious diamond, bigger than most had any seen before. In fact, it was larger than the king's own hand and nearly flawless in its color and clarity. When the king wasn't admiring the diamond himself, the diamond was put on display for all his loyal subjects to admire. Protected by armed guards, of course. Visitors from far and wide came to gaze upon its mythical beauty. As the king's fame grew and his kingdom flourished, he credited this very special diamond as the source of his prosperity. One afternoon, as the king gazed upon the diamond, holding the precious stone to the sunlight, to his horror, he noticed a deep and long crack from the top of the stone to the very bottom. How could this have happened? He exclaimed. With a devastating knowledge that it would be impossible to fix this terrible flaw. His court gathered around him with the most esteemed advisors attempting to calm his fears. The best jewelers throughout his kingdom visited his throne room to examine the flawed diamond. After inspecting the crack, most were concerned that any attempt to work on the stone to try and fix it would split the diamond. The only ones to offer solutions suggested cutting the diamond into two new gems. And it would still be the largest in the land, but the king refused. Finally, a poor elderly man arrived at the palace and asked if he could examine the stone. Initially, the king's guards thought he might be homeless, but quickly learned he was a gifted stone cutter whose engraving artistry was thought to be the best known in all the world. After looking at the flawed diamond, this old man looked at the king and said, Your Highness, I know what to do. I can fix this. Not only will I restore the diamond's beauty, but I will make it more valuable than you can ever imagine. The king sat in disbelief, wondering about the audacity of this old man's claim. Your Majesty, all I ask is that you let me do my work undisturbed and unmonitored. And in two weeks' time, I will return your diamond to you. In the meantime, allow your patience and trust to give me the privacy I need to focus on my work. The king, concerned it might be a, a, a con, agreed, adding the condition that the elderly stonecutter must do his work in the palace. A room was prepared and the guards appointed to keep watch over the old man's coming and going. With that, the old man took the stone and began the slow, undramatic work of restoration. The king couldn't rest, obsessed over the future of his most prized possession. After two weeks, the old man let the guards know that he was finished and he would like to present the diamond to his king. 
So the palace guards rushed to the king's throne room with the most anticipated news of the kingdom, and the whole court was assembled for the presentation. Standing before his majesty, the elderly stone counter held up the diamond wrapped in a dirty old polishing rag. He carefully pulled the stone from the cloth. There, engraved on the top of the diamond, was an exquisite flower, and the crack down the middle of the stone was its stem. The king was astonished. The diamond was actually more stunning than before and more beautiful than anyone could have dreamed. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for making each one of us diamonds of our own. Thank you, God, that we shine and sparkle in our own ways because we are made in your image. But God, we can be like the king, and we can be obsessed over these cracks that we see in ourselves. And even worse, we can be obsessed over the cracks we see in other people, completely missing the work that you are doing in our lives today. Our prayer this morning is that we would have the eyes of Jesus, we would have the eyes of this elderly stonecutter who could see past the humanity in all of us, to see the work that God's doing, the restoration, making us beautiful flowers, each one of us, every day. Lord, help us to see with those eyes in ourselves and in each other today. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you.
This morning we have one letter of well wishing going out to Martin Lavengood, who's the chapel at the Evergreens, and he'll be receiving surgery this week, so he is our one letter of well wishing. Friends, let us go before the Lord in intercessory prayer. Lord God eternal, your mercy and gracious love is toward all who revere you. Your faithfulness never fails. Your justice endures forever. Your peace will be established at last. Lord God eternal, thanks be to you for your steadfastness for the generations your church has been steadfast in this city. We lift up the joys and sorrows of this congregation for Martin Lavengood and for those on the Haiti mission trip. Help them to be the hands and feet of Jesus in an unfamiliar place. Thanks be to you for generation after generation of faithful men and women who have served your church in this city. Lord, we come with our prayers for the church, for our own church in Morristown, for our sister churches in this place. Grant that together we might carry out a faithful ministry to this city today. Lord God eternal, whose justice endures forever. We pray for all peoples. We remember particularly the Democratic Republic of the Congo and their political crisis, alongside those in Indonesia affected by the tsunami. Grant that justice, equity, and peace might be established in these lands. Lord God eternal, your mercy is toward all who revere you. Your peace will be established at last. Your faithfulness never fails. Thanks be to you, ever gracious God. We pray for our own land and people, for our president and civil servants of all kinds. Lord, remember the employees who are required to work without pay because of the impasse. Grant that all would be anointed with the gifts of honesty, industry, fairness, and generosity as important decisions take place with urgency amidst the coming weeks. Lord God eternal, whose gracious love is toward all who revere you, we pray for members of this congregation in special need, making mention of them in the silence of our own hearts. We pray for ourselves. You know our needs, and we lay them before you, for you are our God. To you, Lord God eternal, our sustainer forever and ever, be all praise and honor and to your Son, all power and glory, for we pray in Jesus' name as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now worship God as we offer our lives and morning tithes and offerings. I invite the ushers forward to receive our offering.
Lord, we give thanks for all that we have received, gifts of love and time, money and abilities. Into these bowls and into this place, we return a portion of these gifts. Bless those who receive them, just as we are blessed in the act of sharing them. Amen. Please be seated. First off, Happy New Year, Church. <laughs> it is so good to see you all here this morning, and I feel so blessed to ex have experienced my first Christmas here in Morristown and my first Christmas here at First Presbyterian Church. It was beautiful. It was magical. I loved having the children involved. I loved hearing all the choirs sing. It was so special, and I just wanted to say it's so good to see you all, and I'm so thankful to begin a new year with you all, too. So I hope that you and your loved ones enjoyed a very healthy and joy-filled Christmas season. And it's not quite over yet because today is Epiphany Sunday. That's why we have our Christ candle lit. Because it's the celebration of God's manifestation or God's self-revelation to the world. We see God right in Jesus Christ. So epiphany, this word is Greek, and it basically means to reveal. So today on Epiphany Sunday, we celebrate the revelation of God's promise, that is Jesus Christ, and God's purpose to all nations of the world. We celebrate God coming to us because through God's epiphany, God's real presence on the earth and in our own lives, we can receive the good news of Jesus Christ. He thinks it's good news, too. I heard that. <laughs> and I know so many of us have already made New Year's resolutions, or maybe like my grandfather, who I talked to on the phone yesterday, said, ah, I never do that. So don't get me wrong. I think that it's great to set goals. It's smart to create a budget or work on becoming physically healthy. But maybe it's also time as individuals and as a church to lean into something a little bit deeper. Maybe it's time to not only receive the good news of Jesus in your life, whether you've already done that or whether it's time to do it again, to receive it but also to be the good news for our hurting world. See, this is our highest calling as people who profess Christ, as the body of Christ. We are meant to receive the good news, but especially to be the good news to our partners and to our family, to our neighbors and coworkers, our baristas we see every week getting coffee at Starbucks or any cashier or waiter we come in contact, anyone we encounter. And this is something that Paul emphasizes in our scripture today. Today's scripture comes from Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul, or perhaps a disciple of Paul, is writing to a church community made up of Jews and Gentiles. And we can relate to this church from the first century, because at some point in our lives, we've done the same thing that they did. That we've lost focus on what ultimately matters in our own lives and as a community living out the gospel for the glory of God. And isn't this what resolutions are about when you profess Christ? To reorient ourselves towards Jesus, who brings us individual health and communal vitality. We have all been sidetracked. I know I have been. By desires, distractions, and evil powers that have little or absolutely nothing to do with the good news of Jesus Christ. So Paul calls out the early church, but does it in a really encouraging way. And Paul even taps first press on the shoulder this morning. 
and reminds us of God's incredible plan for all of humanity, for you and for me. And it starts with the church right here. It's time to reconsider your New Year's resolution, Paul says. Maybe forget it all together. It's time to be the church in a new, exciting, and life-giving way, Paul says. So let's listen to Paul's message for us today. Today's reading comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to us, his holy apostles and prophets, by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. Let us pray together. <clears throat> Holy God, thank you for revealing yourself to us in Jesus. Help us this year to know you in new and profound ways. And not that just this year, but even this week, today, and these next 10 or 15 minutes. Help us to receive your grace and good news in our lives so that we can reflect your hope and your love and your truth in a world that is so desperate for such things. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts glorify you, O God, and honor you, Jesus. Amen. So Ephesians may be a short book in the New Testament, but don't let its size fool you. Because when it comes to all of Paul's letters, theologians describe Ephesians as, and I quote, the most comprehensive and cohesive portrait of God's plans and purposes. So of all of Paul's letters, this is what Ephesians is known for, communicating to us God's great purposes and plans as individuals and as one worldwide. Ephesians has a lot to say about the church's mission, namely that the church represents God's ultimate purpose in history, and that all Christians should find their life's purpose in God's ultimate purpose. So, that's kind of a big ask, but it's also an incredible calling. How do we go about finding our purpose in God's ultimate purpose? It's a big question. It's a worthy question. And this was a question I asked myself many years ago, and I still do, 
But it really puzzled me at a time in my life where I was just adrift. Right before I graduated college, I turned down a wonderful job that I had initially been really excited about, but the closer I came to graduation, the more I realized that this was not was no longer in it. I wasn't being called to stay in Los Angeles, where this job was, where I went to college. Which meant, suddenly, I found myself going where I hadn't planned on going, back home, to Seattle, Washington. So after graduation, I packed all my boxes in a very small, outdated sedan with awful AC, and I drove all my boxes from Los Angeles, California, all the way up to Seattle. And I camped along the Pacific coast, and that may sound like a beautiful vacation, but for me, it was a way for me to save money rather than staying at hotels. And I ate really fancy food like canned tuna and crackers. Clearly, I was living my best, most glamorous life. And yet I was really divided. I was divided within. I was unsure of my future, my direction in life. And it's not hard to see division in our own lives, or in our world, in our government, even in our own denomination. I felt like the world was pressing in on me, and I had no idea where to go. I just knew I needed enough gas to get to Seattle. So not long after I moved into my parents' house, and with a long sigh, I asked, now what? Now what am I going to do? And no sooner had I asked that question than I received an unexpected offer from family friends. Raise our kids, my family friend said, a woman named Ellie that I had known for many years. We need a full-time nanny all of a sudden, she said, and look how cute our kids are. Who can say no to these two? You know, and she was right because they were cute, but more importantly, I had bills to pay and independence to defend, so how could I say no? So I knew that this job would involve a lot of intense caregiving and driving kids to preschool and taking care of them if they were sick and everything parents do around the clock. But what I didn't see coming was the incredible change in formation that these two children would bring to my life. In the same way that Ephesians has been called the most comprehensive and cohesive portrait of God's plans and purposes, the two kids I nannied, two-year-old Willie and nine-month-old Ruby, they became the most cohesive portraits of God's love and purpose in my life. They grew me. They transformed me. They altered my definition of words like love and patience, or frustration and exhaustion, but especially gratitude and joy. And suddenly, the mystery of what I was going to do with my life was revealed. It took a few years, but I realized through Willie and Ruby that they weren't just a means to my end but they were beautiful and sacred, ends within themselves. It's like Paul describes in verse 8. Willie and Ruby showed me that, you know, the news of the boundless riches of Christ through their wonderful personalities and growth. And these two small children unveiled the mystery of God's grace in my life. They completely changed my worldview and how I identified. See, by the time I graduated college, I had become so focused on me, on my social status, on my ego, on my notions of power and wealth and ambition and what success looked like, that I had written off certain vocations as completely unworthy, as undignified, especially nannying. 
I had done that to get my way through college. I had done that throughout high school. So now that I finally earned my beautiful bachelor's of arts in English literature and philosophy, there was no way I was going to go back to doing the things of, of old. <sighs> but there I was, nannying. And even though at first I thought this was an undignified calling, man, was I wrong. And let me tell you, I'm not alone in history in thinking this. Because the early church that we just heard about in Ephesians 3, they really struggled with their own identity and their own formation and worldview too. See, both Jews and Gentiles, they viewed each other as somewhat undignified. Because after all, they had vastly different ethnic, cultural, and religious backgrounds, which caused all sorts of problems when they came together to worship. See, they both confessed that, yes, Jesus was Lord. But man, did they have different ways of expressing it. Sound familiar? Which is why Paul reminds the early church of something astonishing, groundbreaking, and deeply humbling. He sets a historical precedent when Paul points to Christ on the cross in the first century. See, this is the anchor that holds throughout all of time, no matter what we go through in life, no matter how much tuna and crackers you have to eat to get to Seattle. Christ on the cross is the anchor that holds. This is where our identity begins and ends. And the same goes for the mystery of God's plans and purposes. The cross is the answer to the mystery, Paul says. Through the grace and unconditional love of Jesus Christ, every single person is reconciled to God. And taking it a step further, every person is reconciled to every person. Paul discloses God's secret plan for all of humankind, for all of time. Yes, that even Jews and Gentiles become one body through faith in Christ. And so the church becomes a radical countercultural witness to the power of God's love and unity. The church becomes an audacious symbol of hope and peace and transformation in a divided, oppressive world. When we are bound to Christ, we are bound to one another. There is no inferiority or superiority. And for anyone living in the first century in the Roman Empire, this is about as radical a worldview as you can get. Because in first century Rome, hard lines were drawn between the powerful and the powerless, the privileged and the poor, between different classes and genders, and in many ways, is this still not our society today? Perhaps even some of our churches. And yet Paul has a message of hope for us has an incredible invitation for each one of us in this room today. See, Paul, he says that the church is the model of God's vision for the world. Like a model on a catwalk whose gift is to showcase incredible creativity and design, we are like that model because we are called to showcase God's design for the world, God's hope for all time and all people. Paul says that the church ought to be a refuge where people experience God's unconditional love and forgiveness, where equality and justice, they're not theories, they are realities. Because once you step outside the body of Christ, Paul says, once you step into the Roman Empire, the fruits of the Spirit, they're not going to be anyone's New Year's resolution. Paul is a realist in that sense. But Paul is also an optimist. He knows that God's grace is real and sufficient for the church, and that when we lean into our calling as one body united in Jesus Christ, that that is a gorgeous model for the world to witness. 
As one theologian puts it, Paul's letter faces the reality of evil which presses upon the human life, both personal and social. So it's no wonder that Paul is a realist when it comes to following Christ. At the same time, he encourages us to strap on our armor against the world in chapter 6. And then he also calls us at the exact same time to soften our hearts. In chapter 5, he says, Brothers and sisters, put away all your bitterness. Put away your wrath. Put away your anger. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Live in love as Christ loved us. And if this isn't a powerful message to begin the new year with, I don't know what is. Be imitators of God. Friends, surely this is the epiphany of Jesus. To live as one body united in Christ. To live in love. This is what it means to be the church in new and life-giving ways. This is what it means to wake up and discover your highest human calling. This is the ultimate resolution. Amen.
Friends, will you please stand with me for the benediction? And following the benediction, we will also pass a sign of peace. So as is tradition, you all are already doing a great job holding one another's hands. And so church, this is 2019, a new year in which we get to be the church in creative ways for the sake of Jesus Christ. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may God's face shine upon you, and may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. And friends, let's share a sign of the peace in the new year. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Happy 2019. Good to see you. Peace be with you.